QC Pod is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. This is QC Pod. I'm Jason Tuga. QC Pod features the people, projects, movements, and ideas that make up the Queen's College community. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash qcpod. Kathy Fauntleroy joins us today on QC Pod. Fauntleroy is Microbiology Laboratory Supervisor at Weill Cornell Hospital. Back in early March, she found herself quite suddenly overseeing COVID-19 testing for the hospital. Fauntleroy has a BA in English from Queens College. She's worked as a microbiologist for many years, and now she's returned to Queens College to study creative nonfiction in our MFA program in creative writing and literary translation. She joins us today for a conversation about her work as a microbiologist, the early days of COVID, how things have progressed, the technology actually involved in COVID-19 testing, the history of race and medical science in America, her own writing, and much, much more. We've all got a lot to learn from Kathy, and I suspect this is going to be a very illuminating conversation. Welcome, Kathy. It's so great to have you here on QC Pod. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure, Kathy. You are a laboratory supervisor at Weill Cornell, where you do a very important job overseeing a great deal of COVID-19 testing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you once described yourself as an invisible first responder. Do I have that right? Yeah, a forgotten responder, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, forgotten responder. That's what it was. I knew it was better than what I was saying. But it must be a really strange situation to be in, being so central to the response to the coronavirus, yet to have so few people see or understand the work you're doing. Well, um, throughout this whole process, I mean, everyone has been really supportive of healthcare workers, which is great. But most people think of nurses and physicians, and they don't think of us in the laboratory. And I hear when I hear all this on the news and I'm hearing about the number of positive COVID cases and all this stuff, I think about, well, who do you think is telling all these people that they have COVID? It's us, you know, but no one thinks about, okay, everyone talks about testing, testing, but we are the ones doing the testing. So I, I wish people would just think a little bit more about those of us that are, you know, in the basement or on some in, tucked in, in some, some corner, corner somewhere, somewhere running, running hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of COVID, COVID tests a day. Yeah, everybody talks about what it's like to go get the test, how uncomfortable it is to have that thing stuck up wow. your nose. But I think very few people, lay people like me, understand what happens after that when the sample goes to the lab. Exactly. Yeah, we are the ones that are not really thought about much. So, Well, that's a good thing you're here then, because people can think about you a little bit more. And I know you'll have a lot more to say about COVID-19. But I think it's worth backing up. QC Pod is about the people and ideas and projects that make Queens College such a vibrant community. And you have a long history with Queens College. I do. You were an English major at Queens College, right? Yes, back in the 90s. Actually, before that, I was a biology major way back in the way back, like in the 80s. And, um, and then I decided that organic chemistry was just not, I, I couldn't get along with organic chemistry. So I ended up, I kept my job as a laboratory technologist, but I decided to go back to school and come back to Queens to pursue my degree in English. I think it would surprise a lot of people to hear that an English major would become a microbiologist. How did that unfold for you? Um, oddly enough, I've always written or always wanted to write and a good portion of my job, what I do is I write procedures. So um, in high school, I, I, I did some writing. And then when I started working and had to write procedures, I thought, you know, gee, this is something I really like to do. And not only do I want to write, you know, procedures for work, I'd like to write other things too. So it was never really a good time to go back to school. And eventually after a while, I decided, okay, 
I, I'm going to go back and, and get this this degree in English. And so I did. And then when I finished, I kept uh, working in microbiology, kept getting, you know, promotions and different jobs. And then I decided I wanted to come back and, and really, really do something at Queens with my writing. We'll definitely talk about your writing. But before we do, how'd you originally get a job in a lab? So in high school, again, I took a microbiology, uh, I took a laboratory techniques course and I thought, wow, I was going to go to medical school. So I thought, well, I could do this job and kind of save money to go to med school. But after a while, I just, I realized I kept getting jobs and, and be better jobs. And so I, I enjoyed working so much. I decided, okay, well, let me just work for a while. So I started working. And as I kept advancing in microbiology, it just, school just sort of got pushed further and further away. It seems pretty impressive that you could do that right out of high school. Uh, yeah, good old Edward R. Murrow High School. And it's funny because Edward R. Murrow was really one of the best journalists of the, you know, of the 20th century. So it, it's interesting that I, I feel like I've come full circle in a way. And now you're back and we're all very happy about that. And you're pursuing your writing and you write about science and medicine. But I happen to know you, you write about it in a really particular way. You write about the human side of science and medicine. I want to help people understand that there is more to medicine than just being a physician or a nurse, that there are other aspects of it. I want especially young people to understand that you can do so much more in medicine or in healthcare without being a physician or a nurse. And I want to talk about the things that affect affect people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, how does diabetes affect your whole family? Or, you know, if you come from a long line of diabetics, how does that affect you? Because I do come from a, a long line of diabetics. Just different things about science and healthcare that will not sound so researchy and so scientific, but that will touch people in a way that will make them think and then make them see things the way that maybe they didn't before. So is it that you're sort of taking your experience and knowledge from the lab and thinking about <clears throat> its implications outside the lab in people's lives? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. There's definitely a book to be written there, or several books, really. Do you think you'll write about COVID-19? I think I have to. Uh, I mean, I, I think that as someone in the laboratory who had, I've, I've been in the laboratory for such a long time, I never thought that we would see anything like this. I mean, you learn about it in school. We were taught about epidemics and pandemics in school, but you know, you just you never think it's it's going to happen. But as I think about it, we've been through quite a few things. When I first started in microbiology, it was at the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic, and I had learned a lot of medical microbiology in school, and it was all in the textbooks, and I knew it enough to regurgitate it for the board exam. I never thought that I would see these things actually in laboratory practice. So at the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic, we started seeing things like tuberculosis and different parasites and yeast infections and all of the things that you just think you're never going to see. Um, so I really learned microbiology in a day-to-day -day clinical setting at that time, at the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic. It was fascinating and tragic at the same time. Yeah, so you've worked through more than one pandemic. Is there a story you can tell us that might illustrate the ways the work you do inside the lab affects people's lives outside the lab or maybe your own life? Ironically, um, I learned from my mother that my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, died from tuberculosis. So I, I thought it really interesting that someone that I loved died of a disease that we had more or less eradicated in, you know, somewhere in the, what, the forties or the fifties. Right. So just one night I'm, I'm, I'm in the laboratory and I'm working with an isolate of TB. And I just start thinking, how ironic is it that I have a grandfather that died of a disease where I see this germ, I see this bacteria almost every day. And it, it just didn't make sense to me. So 
I, I, I realized that in my family, there were no pictures of my grandfather anywhere. So I decided, well, I, I'm going to try to find some pictures. And so I asked various family members and uh, no one had pictures. So I decided, I knew he had served in the military and uh, ultimately my grandmother still had his discharge papers. So I took a copy of the discharge papers and I uh, wrote to, I think it was the National Archives because I wanted to see if there were any photos in his military record. And ironically, there were not. There had been a fire at the National Archives Center and it the U.S. Army lost 80% of those records. So there were no pictures there. But I just thought it odd that I, I, someone could could die of a of a bacteria that I was seeing on a regular basis. And it just didn't make sense to me. So I wanted to dig a little deeper. So there's a human mystery there and, and a family mystery that you wanted to uncover. And it turned out that it's very likely that part of the answer had something to do with race, right? Yes, because it just, he died in 1964 when I was a, a toddler. And I just thought to myself, but even that doesn't make sense because in 1964, we had drugs to cure tuberculosis. So what was it about this? You know, uh, how did he end up dying from tuberculosis? And in all of this, I did learn ultimately from my mother that he had been offered the option of having the lung removed, but he didn't want to. So, which, <laughs> so that led me to thinking about why it was he didn't want to have his lung removed. And she said to me, um, he just, he just, she remembered him saying to her, I'm going to leave this world with everything that I came with. Mm. Well, and I know that is part of a history of, uh, and a belief of many African Americans that they don't want to go to physicians and they don't trust physicians and they don't want to have surgery. And I just thought if only I could have been old enough or if I had been born at a different time when I could have advocated for him or helped him to understand, you know, this isn't such a bad thing and you can live a really long time with just one lung. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, timing is everything. Yeah. Well, there there's a long vexed history of medical abuse in the African-American community, right? Yes. Yeah, and we're seeing it now with COVID. I mean, there are many people who have said to me, oh no, I'm not going to go for that vaccine. And to be fair, I'd actually have to think a couple times about it now no. in, in, in this present situation and with this current administration being mm -hmm. the, the ones to be in charge of this whole thing. I'd have mm -hmm. to think twice about doing it also. But I do know that, there are many African-Americans that are just not really, uh, they don't really believe in the medical establishment. Yeah. I mean, you could have told your grandfather, this procedure is okay. But if he's basing it on the history of experimentation on African-Americans with unsafe procedures. Yeah. He's got a lot, a lot of reasons not to trust. Yeah. And here you are, a, an authority who, you know, really could have advised him about what was safe and what wasn't safe. I wish, I just wish that I could have been around, you know, to help him understand a little bit better. That's a heartbreaking thing to think about. I mean, I guess looking forward, you can be around, you are around now to help uh, other people, to help really all of us think about what are the ethics involved in what we're going through. With that in mind, maybe we should turn to COVID now. Uh, and let's maybe just think back to what was the moment when you knew that COVID was going to change your job completely and all of our lives, actually? It's funny you should ask that question. Um, so the the day that uh, it was late February um, and we had gotten a request from a physician for coronavirus testing. Now we do test for coronavirus in our laboratory. And at this point, um, the virus had just started to make the news. We were getting alerts from the Department of Health, and but it was always associated with a travel history that the person would have had to have traveled to Wuhan or you know, somewhere in China. So we get this request from this physician who asked about coronavirus testing and we had to put him in touch with the Department of Health. 
So the Department of Health decided not to take the case because the patient had no travel history. I didn't think anymore. I really didn't think anymore about it that week. That was the last week of February. So the following week, first week of March, we started getting a few more requests. So, okay, now the Department of Health is telling us, okay, we will take those samples. If you get requests for them, send them to us. So on, I, I actually can tell you the date. So on March 5th, I left the laboratory. I, I was going to have a day off the next day. There were There was one sample that we were sending out to the Department of Health that day. I was off on Friday. I was off the weekend. I came back that Monday. There were 45, maybe 50 samples. By that afternoon, there were maybe 25 more. And it was quite obvious early on, okay, this us sending packaging up these samples and sending them to the DOH isn't really going to be something that we can maintain for an extended period of time. So uh, our molecular pathology department in the hospital decided that they were going to bring up a test that they would be able to do. So they validated their tests within a few days, uh, within about a week. So in the meantime, we're still sending results to the Department of Health. And now it's hundreds of samples every day that we're sending. And we're seeing them come back positive, positive, positive. So now we realize, okay, even the molecular pathology lab isn't going to be able to handle this amount of volume. So we need to bring in something high throughput. By that Sunday, I think it was the 14th or the 15th of March, we knew, okay, this just, this is something that we're going to have to get a handle on right now. So we actually had a meeting on Sunday and uh, our laboratory director and our uh, clinical director decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we established a plan for what we were going to bring in as our high throughput uh, instrumentation to handle this test, because we knew we were going to get hundreds and hundreds of samples every day. So inside of two weeks, we had to find laboratory space. We had to, uh, in addition to having the laboratory space, we had to train people. We had to get the instrumentation in. We had to get people comfortable with using it. We had to staff the laboratory 24 seven. So there was a lot that had to go into that. And we only had, we literally had two weeks. So there was no margin for error. And there was a lot of pressure on us as a team to get this going. And you had to deal with people who had their own fears about the virus and people who were trying to figure out what they were going to do with their children. Because now, by this time, I forget when uh, the city was shut down. It was somewhere in there. Maybe it was around the 15th or 16th or something. I forget which. And now the city is shut down. So you've got a shutdown city. And now I've got, you know, technologists and staff in the laboratory. Everybody's concerned about how this is all going to play out. So um, we had to we had to get the lab accustomed to social distancing. So we staggered shifts. We put people on, you know, early shifts. We put some people on late shifts so that they wouldn't overlap. Or if they did overlap, it would be for a short period of time. Um, and then we staffed our COVID lab 24 seven. I, I took some overnight shifts and worked with people and actually physically ran samples every single day. Is it possible for you to describe the technology involved in the testing in a way that people just not familiar with the science will be able to understand? Okay, so basically once the sample comes in, we it gets scanned in by the computer so we can log it in and attach a number to it. Um, uh, the swab that's in the pink liquid that's inside that tube. So essentially the cells that they take from your nasal cavity with that swab are released into that liquid. And what's in that liquid is something that's going to support viruses. It's got like sucrose and some antibiotics to kill regular bacteria. So we take a small amount of that sample and put it in a test tube. That tube goes on the instrument. It gets, the cells get lysed the virus particles get released. They get washed uh, a couple of times throughout this process. And then the once the viral particles are cleaned, we amplify them, we multiply them multiple times. So what happens is the number of times that you amplify that virus, if it takes a short amount of time for you to amplify that virus, that means you've got a lot of virus particles there. So you've got a pretty good infection. Mm -hmm. um, and if it takes a bit longer, 
then you, you probably got like a low level infection. So what it does is it gives off a fluorescent signal and it's that fluorescent signal that gives you the cycle threshold value. And that's what the physician uses to determine just how bad your infection is. And which parts of this process are done manually and which are which involve a machine? Uh, all of the assay is with an instrument. The only part that's done manually is when that small amount of sample is removed from that vial and put in a test tube. That's okay. But it also involves, uh, you know, in between every five samples, we have to change gloves, bleach down the area. You know, there are some other, some, there's some manual stuff that goes into it that doesn't that doesn't involve the assay, but just that you've got to keep the area very clean so that you don't uh, contaminate the other samples that you're working with. And the assay is the machine. Correct. Yes. So what does what does the assay look like? How big is it, and how does it work? It is a very large machine. It basically fills the room, and the only thing in that room is the instrument. It extracts the virus particles in one section of the instrument. And then in the second section, section it washes them, cleans them. And then in the third section, it amplifies them so that you get the actual number for the amount of virus that you have in that sample. How long does that process take? The whole assay takes about three hours. That one takes about three hours. We have some others, some rapid tests that we do that take about 45 minutes. But one of the challenges of that particular assay is that the production of those cartridges that we use are limited. The companies are starting to limit those reagents and products that we use to detect the virus. So now we had to really save that test for people who are having emergency surgery or patients in labor and delivery that need to know their COVID status before they deliver and that kind of stuff. So it, some of the challenges in this process have been getting the products that we need to actually run the test. I see. So different tests for different situations. With that original test, the, the one you use mostly that takes three hours, how many samples can you run at a time? A multiple. We can run in one run, we can run uh, 92 samples and take about three hours. Yeah. And we do this at multiple this point, times a day. How much does it fluctuate how many you're doing a day? Uh, to, I think today we ran about wow. 700 samples on the day shift. And we're probably going to run another 120 or 150 mm. on the overnight. And by this point, so, have you yeah. settled into a routine? Or is it, are you, is it still a learning experience every day? Mm. It's still a moving target every day. Um, we, we've more or less settled into a routine with the high throughput instruments, but because we've had so many challenges with getting the, the reagents and the products that we need on any given day, we might have to say, okay, well, we can't run this test. We've got to run everything on this, or we can't run these patients on the rapid test. We've got to run only the easy patients where someone's going to have an, a mm -hmm. procedure like in a minute or the people who, someone who comes in to deliver a baby and we mm -hmm. don't know what the COVID status is. Of I'm that curious, person. back in Mar March and April, what was the emotional atmosphere like in the lab? People were tense. A lot of people were concerned about um, whether or not they were going to come in contact with COVID. I mean, we were fortunate enough that we had PPE. We didn't have those challenges mm -hmm. that I know some institutions did have. And a lot of people were just concerned that which way is this going? And I think everyone thought for a while that, okay, well, we'll do this for a couple of months and then we'll go back to life mm -hmm. the way it was. And after April, once April hit and people realized, okay, this isn't, you know, we're still in this. How much longer is this going to go on? And people started to really become concerned about how much this was taking over our lives. I mean, we weren't able to go anywhere or, you know, life as we knew it was no more. So a lot of people were concerned about that and whether or not most people were concerned about whether or not they were going to either bring something home to their families or if they were going to contract the virus. Is there patients. some sort of testing procedure for people who work in the lab? So 
Uh, we are getting temperature checks every day. And we did have the antibody tests um, somewhere around, I think it was in May, we all got the antibody tests because they, I guess they wanted to see where our status was. Most of us, in fact, all of us that I know, mm. everyone was negative. Um, we've been doing some surveillance testing for nursing homes and some other places. But, um, and now we are at a point where we've, people are sort of venturing out a bit. So we've got those issues where I've got folks that are like, oh, well, I was exposed to someone who tested positive. And so we have to quarantine those people. Um, so the staffing issue comes from that. I've, we've got people who've got to quarantine themselves. Um, and just folks that uh, maybe someone, some have traveled. So you have to get COVID tested when you come back mm -hmm. from if you've been to a state where it's a hot spot. And, so the staffing is is a, a challenge every day. Do you feel safe? I do, honestly. I, at this point, I, I don't go anywhere. <laughs> I go to work yeah. and I come home. So I don't really go anywhere. And we are diligent. We are meticulous about, um, I've bleached so many clothes at this point because we use a lot of bleach. We use a lot of bleach wipes and we're changing gloves, you know, multiple times a day. It's crazy. You've been doing this work since late February, so eight months now. I'm curious if you have some advice for those of us who aren't on the front lines of this pandemic. Well, I think people are going to have to be very mindful of contact and and hand washing. I mean, hand washing has always been good. I don't know why people, this is a new experience for some people, but hand washing has always been amazing. Um, I think uh, people are just, it's going to change us for sure. We're going to, we're going to be different. I, I just think that people are going to have to be a bit more careful with their health. You know, cigarette smoking and, you know, all, all, just basic things that you would need to be doing anyway that will not compromise your immune system, you know, do your best to keep yourself healthy and, you know, not susceptible to what's running around out here, you know, and as far as touching things and really just stay vigilant with your hand washing. I mean, at this point, we know so little about this virus. It's really hard to tell. And it's really hard to say what we should be doing other than um, what we've been doing thus far. I think masks are really important and people should wear them. It sounds like you're on board with Dr. Fauci and it's pretty much common sense. Uh, wash your hands, distance, stay healthy. And we should probably all attend to our mental health, but yeah, uh, sounds like pretty sensible advice. It is. And initially, as we would sit around chatting in the off hours during the early phase of COVID, we all surmise, oh, it has to be airborne. It's no way this virus is this contagious and it's not transmitted through the air. I mean, just basic what we knew as microbiologists, we more or less figured. So we figured the social distancing and the masking was a good way to go. Um, so I, I think until we learn more about this virus, I don't know that I, I really don't have an answer, a real solid answer to that question. It's clear you have a lot to say about COVID-19, about the pandemic, about your experience of it. Do you know what you'd like to write about it or is it just too soon to answer that question? That's a very good question. And my answer to that question is no, not yet. But I think ultimately I will. I've, I've seen how I was for, I'm fortunate at the hospital where I work. Uh, we've wanted for nothing. I mean, we had all of the PPE that we needed and for the most part, we have been able to run our assay every day and have everything that we've needed. I've known people in other institutions 
that have not been so fortunate. So I, I might want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I know that it really helps to work at a well-funded institution. Um, I think I, I might want to talk ultimately about how this is going to affect all institutions financially, because this has been profoundly expensive. And um, so we have to live with what this is going to do to um, our healthcare system from a perspective of the budget, what what this is going to do to the budget. Um, it's also some people who were close to retirement are now retiring. So the experienced people that you have, the people that you want to be in the foxhole with in situations like this, those people are leaving. And so we're coming so what's coming into the program, into these programs now are young people who don't have a lot of experience with how to really, you know, dig in your heels and get through a situation or, um, or come through programs, finish programs and come in with knowledge that you need in situations like this. Cause this is not a situation where you want to be someone that's green you know, you want you want people who've been around the block a few times, and um, we're not seeing a lot of that. So uh, I'm, I I want to talk about the staffing issue and and how people who have a lot of experience are no longer going are are leaving the field, and we're not getting enough people coming into the field to make this sustainable. It sounds like there's a socio political dimension to this too, in terms of the distribution of resources. You happen to work for a state of the art, well funded institution, right? So that means you have a good experience. Yes. Um, do you think we're going to learn any of those socio political lessons? If we keep this current administration, no. <laughs> Had to, no, I don't. Um, You mentioned people you'd want to be in a foxhole with. Uh, can you think of, I don't know, people or stories that you just really think are great examples of what we do need now? It's not one single person. It is the people that often are not seen that you may walk past every day coming in or out of your facility the people who keep the buildings clean. Those folks that are the ones doing all the wipe downs that were doing all this stuff before, but now their jobs are super important because now you've got folks, you've got these people who are doing 10 times more with cleaning a building than they were before. And those folks are often not appreciated and not even seen. Some people walk past them and do not even say hello. I make it a point to say hello to those people because yes, everyone's going to see the nurses and the physicians and they might even see me, but no one's going to see those folks. So those are the people that I am grateful for every day because they are keeping our, they're keeping our building clean and they're keeping our facility more or less at, as well as sense, it can be kept. What you're describing really is like that this. they're making our lives possible. Yes, they are. They really are. And um, we've lost a few people in our uh, in our institution who were part of that facilities crew from COVID. Um, yeah, we've lost some folks. When you say lost, you mean they died? Lost them to COVID, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, 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 I have a lot of respect for those people. And, and oftentimes, those are the folks that get overlooked in, in big institutions or anywhere, you know, those people who are really the ones that we are all dependent on at this point. There's an essay there. Yes, there I is. feel like you should write that for a major publication that everyone reads because <laughs> people need to hear this. Yeah. And I, and I wish, don't just walk past those people, you know, and I see some of them every day and I make it a point to say hello or good morning or whatever. It, it's just, it's just decent. You know, it's the decent thing to do, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there anything else you want to bring in that we haven't touched on? At the beginning of the pandemic, 
I noticed people were really, people were asking each other, how are you? How's your family? Is everybody okay? Mm -hmm. You know, people were really concerned about how everybody was doing. I hope that we stay those people. I hope that we don't go back to those busy people that just, hey, how you doing? On the way to somewhere, or we don't stop and take the time to mm -hmm. listen. Hey, is your family okay? How are you? How are you guys holding up? I hope that we are not those people anymore. Mm -hmm. I hope we stay the concerned people, people that, that we were, were at the beginning, beginning of this pandemic. pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, before this pandemic, when you would say to somebody, hey, how you doing? The answer was almost always, great, fine, I'm doing well, right? That's really changed now. People say things like, I'm tired, I'm scared, I don't know, I'm confused, I don't even know how yes. I feel. Yes, I mean, I had moments during this where I thought, I don't know if today is going to be that day that I don't make it. I mean, because the pressure to get this right in, in a matter of 14 days was incredible. And I was, because I was working overnight shifts, my sleep pattern was off. So I didn't sleep. There were days where I would go a full 24 hours before I would close my eyes. And so, you know, and I would always, I'd have to be mindful of, you know, really paying attention to what you're doing. Because when you're sleep deprived and you're tired, you, it's easy to make a mistake. You make a mistake, you infect yourself, you drop a sample on the floor and everyone's got to leave that room. So you really have to, you know, you really have to, you have to take care of yourself and you have to really pay attention to, uh, to what you're doing. So there were days when I, I would just duck into the bathroom and just say, okay, let me just take a couple of deep breaths and come out because there were, I didn't have time in most, most of the days I didn't have time to think about how I was doing because I had to think about how other people were doing. You know, how are my coworkers? Is everybody okay? Do they have enough of what they need? Do they have food? Is this, you know, I mean, you gotta keep people together. So I often would come home to my apartment empty. I, I, I live alone, my family's in Virginia. And I would think to myself, you know, I'm here alone. and other people are going home to someone every night. So it, it was isolating at times. And, you know, there were days when I had, I had moments where I was like, whew, don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really appreciate that candor. I think a lot of people will because, uh, you know, you have a very unique relationship to this pandemic, but everybody's going through it. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess I just want to take your advice and ask, how are you today? I'm good. I'm tired a lot. Um, school keeps me connected to what my life was like before Corona, even though it's Zoom, even though all my classes are on Zoom, I still feel in those moments that I'm in class, I feel like, okay, I don't have to worry about this pandemic outside my door. You know, I, for these two hours, I'm a student and that's, this is nice. And in some ways that even being in class on Zoom has made me closer to the people that I'm in class with because I'm seeing, look at you, know, looking inside my, I'm seeing inside people's homes and, you know, mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. maybe spending time after class talking about things that we might not talk about after class if we were on campus because everybody's rushing to get home or rushing to get out to catch the bus or get out of the parking spot or whatever. Whereas now we are actually taking time to talk to one another where I don't think we would have been doing that before. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm good though. I'm, I'm, you know, every day I get up, I do it again. On behalf of Queens college, I would just like to say Kathy Fontleroy that I'm really glad that you are back as an active member of our community. I am so happy to be back at Queens. Really. I am really happy to be back. Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy you're back too. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, this is great fun. Thank you so much for having me. Our guest today on QC Pod has been Kathy Fontleroy, microbiology laboratory supervisor and head of COVID testing at Weill Cornell Medical College, and recently rejoined member of the Queens College community studying creative nonfiction in our MFA program in creative writing and literary translation. Mm -hmm.
You've been listening to QC Pod, the podcast about all things Queens College. We're on Twitter at QC Pod and on the web at queenspodcastlab.org/qcpod. Our theme music is Lake Monsters by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. I'm Jason Tuga. Thanks for listening. <laughs>